Hello and welcome. And thank you for joining us for our second episode of Nature Revisited. But first, I would like to thank everyone for your wonderful response to Nature Revisited in our first episode. Peter Hatch on Jefferson, Monticello, Gardening and Nature. Please keep your reviews and ideas coming. We truly appreciate all of them. It has been a long and cold winter, and most of us are looking forward to spring. So what better way to anticipate the wonders of spring than by having a conversation with David Culp. David is a gardener, plantsman, designer, and the author of the book, The Layered Garden, which has inspired many a wonderful garden. Last year, Sean Clausen and I traveled to Pennsylvania to spend an afternoon with David in his garden, planting, talking, and enjoying what nature had to offer. When we visited David at Brandywine Cottage, it was a beautiful spring day. Even though there was still snow in my garden, by the time we arrived, David was already out digging. Here then are some of the highlights of that afternoon. I actually probably, yeah, I might need two more. And then any agapan or any? No, no, you're right, you're right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, this is perfect in here, Matthew. What is? These little, these are they're very appropriate that I have hellebores in this spot since it's a hellebore garden, you know? Yeah. So we've been doing a road trip sort of south to north for the last uh, five days. So we were down at, you know, Mount Vernon. We were down at uh, Monticello. So most of your guys you do your interviews with, they're usually not down on their knees planting. <laughs> you, you would be the first, but it, I oh, think it's pretty, a, thing. pretty appropriate though, this I think. This is the real McCoy. This is the real McCoy. Oh, oh my God. Like, what? This is exciting. How do we want to introduce you? How do we introduce you? I say, you introduce me as a real gardener. That's how you introduce me. <laughs> oh, we'll get along with you then. That's what you've been looking for. That's the highest calling in my book. I mean, this kind of thing. That's where I get my strength. Right there. <laughs> Do I like that or do I not? That is the question. And I think I might need one more because I like to usually use odd numbers. What are you kind of going for here today? I'm going to, well, I really like white and green because it's really fresh and kind of quintessential spring. And it's a classic combination. And when the dogwoods come on, the green with the white, it's just echoing, bringing that color down, and it just looks so fresh, and it's like, yeah, spring's here, in kind of a nice, quiet kind of way. And I like to use my bare hands. I seldom use gloves, because I have a better feel for what I'm doing, what I'm touching. What's nature feel like? Electricity. Explain what you were saying before about your, with your hands in the dirt. What were you talking about? I was thinking I'm a lucky guy because I know where I get my strength. I get my strength from touching the soil. That's what makes me David. That's what I like most of anything, is uh, being one with nature. I, there's a little clump here. Uh, yeah. How long have you been one with nature? I like to think my whole life. Um, I always gardened. I can remember gardening, you know, the proverbial Jack and the Beanstalk uh, in a Dutch master cigar box, uh, planting uh, pumpkin seeds. Just the magic of watching something grow. And I think that's the probably common denominator of all gardeners is watching something grow. You can be very cerebral in your design, but really the common denominator is watching a plant grow. And for me, touching the soil, touching the plants, is what makes David David. Watching the magic happen. Participating with the magic. <laughs> but much like the whole garden, 
I like nature to speak first and then the designer to speak secondly. I would disguise myself as a plantsman. Is that different from a gardener? A gardener is one who tends plants and the kind of gardener I am is the essence of my art form or what I do is about the plants. It's the plants comes first. The plant is my major interest. The plants speak first. Now oh, we have more work to do. So one, two, three. I got my drifts coming down through this bed. How do you know you're d interpreting what the plants are saying? Well, it just looks right. It looks natural. I mean, it looks, it looks like it's supposed to be, it's not superimposed. It, it looks like it might have just happened. You know, they all might have grown together that way. Uh, gardens like plants, I don't like them to look like they've been superimposed, that they look inevitable. There's a sense of inevitability. Have you learned that or is it something you've always known? Look at the hillside. <laughs> uh, I, I've kind of always known that because of my early childhood growing up in the, my grandparents in the mountains. It's something that I've kind of duplicated all my life is that sense of naturalism. And that's what I try to recreate is that enhanced nature, uh, enhanced naturalism. That's what I try to do. How often do you get it right and how often do you get it wrong? Uh, I work at it all the time. Um, I never want to completely be done with my work. If I did, I would take up another art form. Gardening's a process, not a product. And I always want to be involved in the process of gardening. Things live, grow, die. And it's the process that I find very intriguing. What, what's the garden taught you? Patience. Uh, it's taught me patience, it's taught me to savor the moment. Gardens unfold. I mean, look at this moment right now with the golden sunlight. Um, we're, we're kind of lucky for that. It's stop and appreciate each moment in the garden. It's, it's our life. Uh, try to appreciate it as much as you can. Everything has its own rhythm. And there's always something else to learn. I think it's taught me that, that's one of the things I find most gratifying, that I'll never know all there is to know about gardening, about plants, and I'll always be learning. I find that really, really, really exciting. Cool, well, I don't want to interrupt your rhythm too much. Okay. Keep following you around. You know, these are the current, I'm painting the picture here. <laughs> and this is how I paint. I paint with plants. Here you go. The ferns are coming out of the bed. My question here is, do I leave them or do I let them go? I really like gardens that look like they just might have a mind of their own, that I'm not doing it all themselves, that Mother Nature is at work here. So I'm inclined to leave these for now, just because it looks natural. It's part of the rhythm of the plant. Now granted, I'll probably take them out, but for the moment, they're fine. Now that's another question. How many hellebores have I touched in my lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> that's a hellebore? That's a hellebore. And that's, uh, there's a strain of uh, hellebores called Brandywine hybrids. They all originate here in Brandywine Cottage. And I've touched each plant <laughs> many, many times. When you see the plant blooming in your garden, Here's the hand that touched it. How would you describe it? How would you describe the plant itself? Well, the, the plant itself is a plant with moxie and verve because they start blooming when there's even snow on the ground. They can take 17 degrees. They're one of the first plants out the gate. I have a really bad case of cabin fever. So anything that comes on early helps me know that all's not lost, but then really the colors and the forms and the uncanny time of year at which they bloom. It's one of my favorite plants. Uh, and the garden happens to like them as well because the pH here is neutral. Hellebores like that. Anything in the plant family, ranunculaceae, tends to like that. So if you work from what naturally grows here or what with your site, you're going to be more successful. Personally, I'm a big proponent of naturalism. I really like that innate sense of naturalism, 
because the garden then relates to the larger wild garden. I like that relationship. Uh, you know, native plants that, you know, are becoming very popular, and of course the use of native plants usually dictates a sense of naturalism as well. Again, it's enhancing nature, or like we're talking about today, you know, uh, just kind of maintaining that balance of not control, but uh, keeping a rein on it, but let it, again, speak for themselves, you know, let the, enjoy all aspects of the plant's life, how they come out of the ground, how they bloom, and even how they die, kind of celebrate the whole plant, celebrate the whole landscape that way as it matures. Let the landscape show its own character. We're lucky to be out here on a day like today, you know. I, I, I always feel kind of blessed. There it is. Oh, the orchid. The cypripediums are just coming out of the ground. The, uh, Yay! <laughs> uh, the yellow lady slippers, uh, Cypripedium kentuckiense, they're gorgeous. And they're not the easiest plant to grow. And uh, so I just had my first sighting. You always hold your breath to make sure one, two, three little sprouts, there'll be more welcome friends. Has your work with your hands in the dirt affected your, um, your spiritual life at all? How can man be in nature and not feel spiritual? How, or conversely, how can you be, how can you not feel spiritual and be in nature? I mean, this, it's all in one. This is very spiritual for me. It really resonates with me. It's this stewardship, this care of the land. It's one of, it's just a core value, this, uh, this care of, our environment and the soil. And when I think about it, only becomes further enhanced. Okay, it's something that's there. But as I walk in it and grow in it, the feeling grows. Am I in that moment all the time? I would like to think so, but maybe not. Sometimes are stronger than others, like right now, strong time. Um, but that's, that's life. Hello. Hello. Oh, look at the uh, Erythronium pagoda in bloom back in there. Look at the violets, how sweet is that? Negotiating with nature. I, I suppose that's part of it's responding to the site. Again, it's uh, letting the plant speak first, which we talked about earlier. Uh, making the garden look inevitable, not superimposed, that controlling hand, but yet making it look like the garden is doing it on its own, letting the, the garden speak for itself, letting it, letting it express itself, negotiating with it that way. You know, I'm not going to put a, a plant palette in here that's going to require a real acidic pH because it's not going to grow. You know, so. That's a, that's a negotiator. I'm, our, our plant that's very thirsty needs a lot of water. I'm not going to put that in here because it's just, just not going to grow naturally. We're in Pennsylvania Dutch country. You're in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's about this garden relating to the larger wild garden that you see over the hillside. It's about a relationship with nature. Our regional diversity and celebrating where we garden. But as a child, I would get on a train at the Reading Terminal Market in downtown Philadelphia and ride down to the Blue Ridge Mountains where my maternal grandparents lived. And perhaps this hillside is a reaction to that little guy running the mountains and that sense of the wild. So I've tried to incorporate that sense of the wild and the sense of the pastoral that you find so freely here in southeastern Pennsylvania and put those two emotions in my garden. I've tried to recreate those. As you look up and down this hillside, you can see my love of nature and wild spaces. Empowering other people to garden is probably the best thing I can do in my life, okay, is to say you can do it, to empower others. That's Next to touching the soil, right. that's as good as it gets. And I think in a world that's becoming increasingly more wired, 
that it needs to be more so of a connection. Okay, we need to strive for this balance of uh, the outside world <laughs> and the wired inside world. It's it's very 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 critical. Life's more than a reset button. You know, it's about living, growing, dying. This is we we have one planet. We better take care of it. <laughs> and we, you know, we have one life, and we better take care of it too. <laughs> this is how we do it. And you see this current wave of <laughs> vegetable gardening. How did we ever get away from vegetable gardening? My, you know, but whatever it takes to hook people in as gardeners, I'm happy to aid and abet in that cause. <laughs> but they like that connection to edibles. There's a lot of things here that have gardening hooks to them. If they have a limited space, they might come to it through trough gardening. They're gardening in a different way. Right. And it's us to enhance that and encourage that feeling. You know, however they come to it. Yeah. That's what I want to talk about a little bit later is how the garden is changing and evolving to meet our modern limitations. Well, limitation, you know, and, and we talked on this, touched on this earlier. I think, again, because people are so much inside and so mm -hmm. wired that they've come to gardening because something more to get out into nature. And I think that's a whole lot different than the boomers. Okay, Generation X and Ys are, are more that way, and the boomers came to it through more artful uh, type mm -hmm. experience. And uh, this newer, younger generation, I applaud them. My key word is sustainability. Uh -huh. You know, willingness to live, and how much labor does it take, how lack of water, how lack of fertilizer does it take to make this garden sustainable? You know, so a plant sustainability. And you have to look long and hard to find the right plant and the sustainable plant for the landscape. Uh, that's, that's really key here. And there's a large variety of plants in this garden. I want to take it on the big picture. Okay. Brandy Wine Cottage. There was nothing here before you got here. No. There wasn't a garden here. The, the buildings were here? The buildings were here. Were they part of a larger? 1790s Mindenhall land yep. grant. It was a 200 acre farm. It was subdivided then in the 80s to two acre lots. They were gonna knock the house down. This one? Uh huh, to make it the entrance to the subdivision. And I said, mm, no, don't do that. And it was the all too familiar story of a place that needed somebody to love it. Mm -hmm. It was. The hillside was covered with multiflora roses, poison ivy, uh, lanicera, which we hand cleaned uh, three times without herbicides. We left all the existing trees, again, to enhance the sense of place, but we didn't do any clear-cutting bulldozing. We just responded to it. And this is a stylized woodland, if nothing else. You talk about a sense of place. It's that white house and the white dogwood that gave me the springboard for the a thousand white tulips that are going to bloom in a few weeks, the white picket fence, the white tattoos, you know, it was that green and white moment that I talked about. It, it was those two things that kind of pushed me first on this, where I was going to go design-wise. Why do you think the garden matters? Not only just to other people, but to us as a society, to our future, to the environment? Because life matters. This is life. <laughs> okay. wow. Life matters. and. We're codependent. This whole planet can probably get along without us, but we need it more than it needs us, and that's what's very, very important for our existence as a species. And, you know, and then we, we talked earlier about uh, the spiritual aspect of it, but it's it's down to the survival of us as a species. That's why it's important. It's, that's why we must garden. <laughs> So I like that about gardening. I like the physical aspect of gardening, uh, the health issues of gardening. And they're, all, they're all very important. The emotional part of gardening. I'm much happier, much easier to get along with when I've had my time in the garden. You know, it's just stress relieving. When I lived in Atlanta, I would go to the symphony. And now I can't go to the symphony, but this has become my symphony. You know, having my chickens, having my horned owls, at night, uh, it's become a different kind of uh, 
appreciation of the arts. This is, uh, this is an art form as well. Gardening is the slowest of the performing it, arts. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And, and I get my inspiration from music. I get my inspiration from other gardeners. It comes from all sources. It, you know, I, I put all of that in the garden. It just kind of doesn't come from one place. Where does the garden start and nature begin? My garden? Or any garden. Brandywine Cottage has its limits. They're drawn on a county map. But the world is also my garden. When I feel stressed and go for a hike in the woods, I'm very much a part of that garden, wild garden as well. All of it's my space to care about and tend, but this is my place to garden. So, yeah, the world's my garden. Brandywine Cottage is where I garden. <laughs> I'm, I'm a human species. I live here on this planet. I'm here as much as the trees are here. You know, everyone says, you know, can a man be in a wild garden? Well, indeed, we're part of that wild garden, and we better have a dialogue with that garden for things to go both of our ways. <laughs> Mother Nature can change things on her own, but it may not be in a way that we would like unless we dialogue with her. I can go God, get This it. is gorgeous. This is just... Amazing. It's one of my favorite times of day. I, yeah, of yeah, the low light. yeah, I'm glad you were able to let us it's come here and do streaming. this. Streaming. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, arguably as good as any stained glass. <laughs> <laughs> it's my cathedral. <laughs> Sometimes just to sit here and soak it in is what pushes me forward. To see that sunlight on a spring day, to, to hear that bird. Uh, Thank you. Uh, that's, that is what gives me tomorrow. It gives me now, and it gives me tomorrow. I want to consciously have that thought in my mind more frequently. <laughs> uh, I'll be much better off the more I can remember that it, it's a way of life. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our visit with David and the wonderful time we spent with him in his garden. Please visit our website, NordenProductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, Productions.com. And while you're there, check out the film, Negotiating with Nature. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And please, share this podcast with your friends. This episode was produced by Charles Geegan, Annie Bond, and myself, Stefan Van Norden. I do hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. <laughs> <laughs>